Um, our webinar is going to explore interactions between the clean power plan and renewable energy markets. Let's talk briefly uh, about process. We're recording today's session for those who are uh, unable to join us. And with well over uh, 900 registrants, we will be keeping your phone lines muted. If you have questions, please type them into the question pane on your GoToWebinar control, pan control panel, and we'll pause several times briefly during the presentation for clarifying questions, and ask that you hold all other questions for the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. We're going to end the official portion of the webinar at the top of the hour. However, we'd like to address as many questions as possible so during, uh, during the live session, so we're going to stay on the phone for another 30 minutes after the close of the main session to do that. Let me tell you who uh, we've got with us today. Uh, first is Ed Holt, who's president of Ed Holt & Associates Incorporated, a consulting business based in Maine, specializing in renewable energy policy and green power markets. Ed is here on behalf of CESA, the Clean Energy States Alliance, uh, with support from DOE and the Energy Foundation. We also have Todd Jones with the Center for Resource Solutions. Todd provides analysis and guidance on renewable energy and climate policy design to policymakers, regulators, and others. Let's talk about the Clean Power Plan. As many of you know, last August, EPA issued final rules for the Clean Power Plan. I'm just going to call it the CPP. The, the CPP applies to two types of fossil fuel-fired electric generation units, or EGUs. Uh, first, electric steam generating units, generally coal or oil-fired uh, oil power plants, and natural gas-fired combined cycle generating units. Under the CPP, states are required to develop and implement plans ensuring that the power plants in their state, what we're going to call affected EGUs, either individually, together, or in combination with other measures, achieve first interim CO2 emission performance rates over a period stretching from 2022 to 29, and final CO2 emissions performance rates by 2030. Now, generally, state plans will be framed to articulate either rate-based goals or mass-based goals. Uh, in other words, a plan um, where a state's affected EGUs meet a pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour goal or a mass-based state goal measured in total short tons of CO2 per year. States are able to use clean energy resources as part of their compliance. And our specific focus will be on how they can use renewable energy to do this. So we're addressing the question, what role, what is the role that renewable energy will play in this carbon management framework? One important note, we are not talking about the, re the role of renewable energy in target setting for the state. We're talking about compliance and how renewable energy markets, both regulatory and voluntary, will interact and how they can integrate with state clean power plan compliance plans. So here endeth the clean power plan mini lesson. Thank you. What I'm going to do is virtually hand off the mic to, uh, to Todd from CRS. All right. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, so uh, let's start uh, by talking about how renewable energy is accounted for under different types of programs. So we'll start with a mass-based program. So a mass-based target is set in terms of tons of CO2 emissions. So anything that reduces either emissions or generation at affected units will reduce mass emissions and is automatically reflected in the mass and therefore counted for compliance. And this includes renewable energy, which displaces generation at affected units, reducing generation, avoiding emissions. So this slide is left intentionally blank because under a mass-based system, there's no need for tracking or accounting of renewable energy specifically. Uh, compliance is based solely on stack emissions, which is all that needs to be tracked in the form of allowances. And uh, to that extent, um, that renewable energy generation uh, affects that, uh, it's included. So next slide. All right, so in, in rate-based compliance systems, unlike a uh, mass-based system in which, as we said, measures like renewable energy and energy efficiency that substitute low or zero-emitting generation 
or energy savings for fossil power generation are automatically reflected in the metric for compliance, the stack emissions that affected units, um, those same measures uh, will not affect the emissions rate of fossil plants. So states using rate-based targets and compliance have to perform an explicit adjustment to their rates to reflect these measures and activities, including renewable energy. So this is the equation for the emissions rate of an affected EGU, uh, where rate equals total emissions. Uh, that's the M for mass over total output in megawatt hours. Uh, so again, if, if energy efficiency or renewable energy or another activity avoids generation at an affected EGU, this reduces both the, the numerator and the denominator, but it doesn't change the rate. So as a result, the EPA created a new instrument called an emission rate credit, or ERC, uh, that EGUs can use to adjust the rate for uh, for avoided generation. And as you can see on the right side of the denominator, ERCs are denominated in megawatt hours. They're added to the denominator, effectively lowering the rate. So ERCs are going to be used to track and account for emissions reductions that can be used to adjust a rate in states with, with rate-based plans. So, um, so ERCs are issued by states uh, to, to affected EGUs that emit below a specified rate or a reference rate, also to incremental generation at natural gas units to replace coal generation if the state sets up subcategorized rates for natural gas and coal, and also to qualifying measures that provide substitute generation for affected EGUs or avoid the need for generation from affected G EGUs. So those qualifying measures include renewable energy, and demand-side uh, energy efficiency, and demand-side management, and combined heat and power, and a bunch of other things. Um, and, uh, and, and qualifying measures that get ERCs, they have to be installed after 2012. And there are minimum requirements for, for each different ERC project type, uh, including renewable energy, uh, which I won't go into detail on here. Um, all ERC projects have to be registered and validated with the state, and all ERCs must be issued on the basis of independently verified activity data. So for renewable energy, that's verified generation. Uh, ERCs can be issued to out-of-state measures. So any ERC project can apply to any rate-based state for ERCs, not necessarily just the state that it's located in. Um, but once the ERCs are issued, they're issued in accordance, obviously, with a state regulatory program, and that state's rules will determine how and where those ERCs may be traded. So in other words, a state is going to determine uh, into which states the provider of the ERCs can sell its ERCs based on its trading relationships. Um, and ERCs uh, cannot be issued for qualifying measures located in a mass-based state, except for renewable energy generation, where the energy is delivered to meet load in a rate-based state which does not necessarily need to be the state where the ERC is used. Uh, so that's issuance. Tracking, uh, in a nutshell, uh, tracking. So ERCs have to be tracked from issuance to submission uh, for compliance in an EPA-administered or an EPA-approved tracking system. Um, and then uh, that's all I'll say about tracking for now, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, Trading, there, there are no geographic restrictions on ERC trading that are set by the EPA. Uh, so they can be traded nationally between rate-based states. However, ERCs may only be traded between rate-based states that have either adopted the same subcategorized emission rates for affected EGUs or alternatively adopted a single weighted average emission rate for the group of trading states. Uh, and states can choose to restrict or define the boundaries of ERC trading if they want. So they can be trading ready, meaning that they're open to trading with any other trading ready st state without a formal agreement between states. Or they can enter into formal agreements for specified you know, bilateral or multilateral trading uh, with certain states. Or they can create a plan that provides for joint ERC issuance. Uh, which includes a shared tracking system and coordinated review of, of ERC issuance and so on. So where states choose you know, state-specific or multi-state weighted average emission rates, or they constrain the issuance and trading of ERCs themselves, that may result in distinct ERC markets as opposed to a single national market. So next slide. Okay, so this is this is the good stuff. This is why we're here. We're we're talking about you know what are the implications for 
and what effect will new markets under the Clean Power Plan have on renewable energy markets? And what will the interplay be between um, these new markets and instruments uh, and renewable energy markets, instruments like RECs? So right off the bat, uh, I want to emphasize that the Clean Power Plan will create generation-based carbon markets for the electricity sector, not consumption-based markets for renewable energy like RPSs or the voluntary renewable energy market. So there's no direct overlap with state RPS programs or the voluntary renewable energy market. And there's no double counting of instruments, sort of allowances and IRCs on the one hand and RECs on the other. And I'll explain more on that in a second. Um, but there is interplay. And there may be an effect on the impact of renewable energy markets. Um, states will, will determine the relationship between these instruments. Uh, so renewable energy markets are markets that deliver renewable energy to customers. So markets that are used for renewable energy consumption and delivery claims. And there are both voluntary and compliance markets for renewable energy in the United States. So just as a reminder, uh, if you're a generator, load serving entity, or other type of seller and you want to say that you're delivering renewable energy to a customer or a group of customers on the grid, you need to deliver the RECs to prove that. And if you're a customer and you want to say that you're consuming or using renewable energy or green power on the grid, you need to own the REC in order to prove that. Uh, you do not need to own the REC to say that you're generating renewable energy on the grid. You only need to uh, need the REC to allocate that generation to a particular customer or group of customers. So RECs are for consumption claims to renewable energy. The Clean Power Plan regulates greenhouse gas emissions at affected power plants, um, and at existing affected power plants, and creates generation-based carbon markets for the sector. So these are markets that are used for carbon generation reporting. And that's an important distinction. Next slide. So if we're looking at what impact the Clean Power Plan has on renewable energy markets, the first question we have to answer is about what happens to claims and attributes in renewable energy markets. So because the rate-based compliance um, that rate-based compliance actually involves this new ERC instrument, which can be issued to renewable energy and used by affected EGUs for compliance. I think people initially uh, have questions and concerns around double counting with RECs and disaggregation of RECs, you know, what attribute is included in an ERC and full aggregation of RECs and so on. So I can address that rate-based concern first. Uh, it's worth repeating that RECs and ERCs are distinct and not interchangeable. So RECs cannot be used for clean power plan compliance in rate-based states uh, in place of ERCs. RECs are still used for RPS compliance and are the standard mechanism for tracking and trading renewable energy for end-use consumption. Um, also, ERCs are not a renewable energy only instrument. They can be issued to other generation and non-generation activities as well. Uh, so when we're looking at rate-based compliance and thinking about what happens to claims and attributes, uh, there are sort of three, three questions that, that we want to answer. One, you know, what attribute is included in an ERC? Is that attribute also included in a REC? And are any attributes historically included in a REC disaggregated or no longer included in a REC after the ERC has been issued from the same megawatt hour? So what attribute is included in an ERC? Uh, the attribute included in an ERC is avoided grid emissions. So thinking about the formula for calculating a rate, and since ERCs are, are transacted between renewable energy generators and affected EGUs, I think it can look like the, the ERC is transferring the emission rate of the generator, of the renewable energy generator to the EGU. Um, but ERCs are not only generated by activities that generate power, rather they're generated by activities that avoid generation at affected units, uh, including zero emissions power generation, but also including energy efficiency and transmission distribution measures and, and, and other things. So we know that ERCs don't convey the, the emissions factor of zero emitting generation. Um, next slide. So in fact, the ERC owner reports a reduced emission rate on the basis of avoided grid emissions that result from renewable energy and other qualifying measures. So the calculations that are performed for ERCs, which again is adding zero emissions megawatt hours to the, to the denominator of a rate, simply estimate that effect, even though they don't quantify actual avoided emissions. So that means that an ERC effectively determines the location of avoided grid emissions um, from renewable energy and other qualifying measures uh, 
for clean power plan compliance you know, as being wherever the ERC is used. So trading an ERC uh, transfers the ability to report a reduced rate for compliance on the basis of avoided emissions on the grid. Next slide. So um, this attribute is not also included in a REC. So the, the, the avoided emissions attribute that has historically been included in a REC is not disaggregated or no longer included in a REC after the ERC has been issued from the same megawatt hour. So the ERC owner is effectively reporting that the avoided emissions caused by a megawatt hour of, of renewable energy occurred at their EGU for the purposes of compliance. Um, er, ERCs transfer or determine the location of the avoided emissions on the grid for the purposes of clean power plant compliance. And the REC owner can still claim that their renewable energy generation avoids these emissions, which simply get used for compliance by the ERC owner. So in this case, the REC claim is to the avoided emissions as, as a benefit of renewable energy consumption. So I use renewable energy generation that generation avoids X number of emissions on the grid. The ERC claim is a compliance claim to the avoided emissions for reporting generation. So they're saying the X avoided emissions on the grid from that renewable energy generation occurred on my behalf for the purposes of clean power plan compliance. So both can be made simultaneously, and it doesn't necessarily require a change to the claim made by the, ERC, uh, by the REC owner. Um, and this is true because the clean power plan doesn't allocate or deliver renewable energy or its attributes to specific customers for consumption claims. So if you compare these two diagrams on this slide, RECs are going from the generator to a consumer, and ERCs go from generator to generator. So again, it's consumption versus generation. Another way to think about this, if you're familiar with scopes in GHG accounting, is that one is a scope one claim, the ERC, and the other is a scope two claim, the REC. So a scope one claim doesn't double count or disaggregate a scope two claim. So the REC owner can still claim uh, that they own all the attributes of generation, including avoided grid emissions, and the, the ERC owner can determine the location and use of that attribute, those avoided emissions, for clean power plan compliance. And this means that the same generation can be used for both ERC and REC issuance without disaggregation or double counting of claims and attributes. Next slide. All right, so we said ERCs and RECs are different. Uh, we've already said that in a rate-based system, the location of the avoided emissions is determined by the ERC. Wherever the ERC is used for compliance, that's the location of the avoided grid emissions associated with that renewable energy. So what about a mass-based system? Uh, what happens to avoided grid emissions associated with renewable energy under a mass-based compliance system? So under a mass-based program, you're dealing in allowances rather than ERCs. Uh, and like I said, megawatt hours of renewable energy used for the state RPSs uh, and the voluntary, uh, voluntary renewable energy generation will reduce mass emissions, helping affected EGUs comply automatically. So the cap or the mass-based target will not change. So while renewable energy can help meet the target, it also reduces the cost of compliance for affected EGUs. And if affected EGUs are emitting at the cap, then renewable energy sort of frees up room under the cap for more emissions. So the effect of the cap is to make avoided grid emissions associated with renewable energy effectively equal to zero. Renewable energy no longer avoids emissions on the grid because the level of emissions is set by the cap. Uh, emissions can't be over the cap, and we have to assume that emissions reduced below the cap due to renewable energy will be made up elsewhere. Um, and this affects the voluntary market in particular, um, where it has historically been an important benefit for voluntary consumers to claim not just that they're using renewable energy and that the emissions associated with their electricity is zero, but that the generation has some effect on emissions on the grid. Uh, again, where those emissions are, are capped, voluntary renewable energy no longer has an avoided emissions benefit, and, and uh, nor does the RPS necessarily. And again, um, so, so, um, so that's, uh, th that's what happens to claims and attributes in renewable energy markets uh, as a result of rate-based or mass-based clean power plan compliance. Uh, the next important question is about the effect of the clean power plan on renewable energy markets and market interactions and what happens to supply and demand in renewable energy markets. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the voluntary market and then Ed's going to talk about RPS programs. Um, 
So many companies and individuals purchasing in the voluntary renewable energy market do this as a part of their commitment to reduce their greenhouse gas footprint. Um, and these commitments to renewable energy and avoided uh, emissions uh, go beyond that which is attributed to state or federal policy. So where renewable energy that's sold in the voluntary market is included in clean power plan compliance, meaning it gets issued an ERC for use in a rate-based state, or it's located in a mass-based state with, without a, a set-aside of allowances uh, that get retired on behalf of the voluntary market, uh, those voluntary actions to purchase and develop renewable energy will no longer be going beyond what is required by law for greenhouse gas emissions at affected units. So in other words, the actions of voluntary purchasers with respect to greenhouse gas emissions at affected units will no longer be surplus to regulation. Um, since they get factored into reductions that the state reports to the EPA. Their actions will no longer be qualified as what we call regulatory surplus in terms of avoided emissions at affected units. Rather, these purchases will now be supporting state uh, clean power plan compliance, making it easier for fossil units to comply by increasing the supply of ERCs or reducing mass emissions. Uh, and the same thing happens to compliance markets. RPSs will be supporting uh, clean power plan compliances. There'll be complementary programs in terms of emissions that affected units. Um, except whereas states and the EPA anticipated uh, using RPS as compliance measures and even provided a path for incorporating RPSs into state plans, as Ed's going to discuss, existing voluntary markets for renewable energy really value regulatory surplus for greenhouse gas emissions. And without that, demand in the market you know, could suffer, uh, impacting the effectiveness of the market as a climate change solution for participating companies and individuals. And I'm not sure the EPA really considered this. Um, and I want to repeat that this regulatory surplus issue is, is just about emissions at affected units, um, existing units affected by this, this clean power plan, which will not necessarily be all emitting units that exist or will exist. So that's important. Um, but to restore this regulatory surplus, Rate-based states can set requirements around ERC issuance and trading and use that support voluntary market growth. Uh, for example, keeping ERCs and RECs bundled together uh, or, or preventing the issuance of ERCs for renewable energy that serves the voluntary market. And in mass-based states, reducing the level of the emissions cap or lowering the budget by retiring allowances to account for voluntary renewable energy transactions. And that will ensure that these transactions maintain regulatory surplus. And it will also restore the avoided grid emissions benefit for voluntary renewable energy that we talked about earlier. And this approach has already been taken um, by both California and uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in their cap and trade programs. And these are the kind of actions that would allow voluntary actions to deliver incremental emissions reductions and not simply reduce the costs of uh, clean power plan compliance. Uh, so now I will hand it over to Ed, who's going to talk about um, RPS programs and compliance renewable energy markets. Ed? Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to pivot to uh, shift our focus to compliance markets, which uh, generally are embodied in what we call renewable portfolio standards. Um, the, the main first point that I really want to make is that uh, the RPS and the Clean Power Plan programs are, are they're both compliance programs, but they're really separate. You know, they have different but overlapping goals. One is more clean energy versus the CPP's more explicit goal of lower emissions. Uh, they also, uh, an, well, an RPS uses renewable energy certificates for tracking compliance, uh, whereas the Clean Power Plan uses emission rate credits for rate-based states or allowances for mass-based states. So they have different compliance instruments. And uh, thirdly, they, they impose requirements on different entities. An RPS requirement usually falls on electric utilities or load-serving entities, while the CPP compliance obligation falls on uh, fossil generators. Uh, but nevertheless, the state RPS can help states meet their CPP goals. And they do this simply by displacing emitting generation. In a mass-based state, uh, this helps reduce total emissions from the affected EGUs, and, and by the way, um, we'll, 
continue to use this term, affected EGU. EGU stands for electric generating unit, uh, and the affected EGUs are those that are subject to compliance with the Clean Power Plan. So uh, as, as Todd says, it doesn't really, uh, it can reduce total emissions, but it doesn't lower the cap on emissions. So it just makes it easier for the affected EGUs to meet their mass goals if they run less. And in a rate-based state, the ERCs issued to renewable energy can be used to lower the emission rate of affected EGUs as shown in the uh, previous uh, earlier slide of the equation. Uh, an RPS can be complementary to a clean power plan, just sort of like a silent partner in the background, or it can be incorporated into a state clean power plan uh, plan uh, with uh, more explicit responsibility for clean power plant compliance. And the next slide explains the options for how an RPS can support clean power plan compliance. An RPS can broadly help states meet their emission goals, either in rate-based or mass-based plan. And that's where you know, a lot of the state, a lot of the discussion has been, well, what state, how are states going to do this? Are they going to go to a mass-based or to a rate-based? EPA encourages mass-based plans because they're generally much simpler. States just measure the stack emissions. They don't have to document how they reach the goal. Kind of to use an analogy, they don't need to show the recipe. They, the proof is in the pudding. So with, with rate-based plans, on the other hand, states are issuing ERCs. And ERC issuance depends on careful measurement and verification of renewable energy generation or energy efficiency savings. So for rate-based plans, states need to show the recipe in advance, and they also need a lab analysis of the product after the fact. There's another option that states have, a choice between what EPA calls an emission standards approach and a state measures approach. And this choice is represented by the two rows in this little matrix. The emission standards approach is, is uh, just what its name implies. A state achieves compliance with the Clean Power Plan entirely by imposition of emission standards on the affected EGUs. If we look at the top row of the matrix, the, the dark blue band, we can see that the emission standards approach applies to those affected fossil generators. They are the ones that are responsible for compliance with the emission standards. And in the emission standards approach, an RPS is really a silent partner. As I said earlier, it's a complementary measure. You don't have to document it. Another important distinction of the emission standards approach is that the rate or mass emission standards are imposed by EPA under federal law and enforceable under federal law. Now look at the second row that's labeled state measures approach. State measures are programs or policies adopted where, under state law uh, that can be demonstrated to reduce emissions. They must be enforceable under state law because they're not enforceable under federal law. The key advantage of this approach is that state measures that can be demonstrated to reduce emissions, they can be used to reduce the burden of emission reductions that would otherwise fall on the affected EGUs. As a result, the emission reductions required of affected EGUs could be less stringent because some other state measure is picking up at least some of the burden. The NA in the lower left, uh, lower left cell indicates that a state measures approach is not available if your state chooses a rate-based plan. It's only available in a mass-based plan. Whereas with the emission standards approach, the obligation falls on affected EGUs. In contrast, state measures may apply to entities other than affected EGUs. For example, utilities or other load-serving entities. And if that sounds like an RPS, you're thinking on the right track. Uh, a state could choose a state measures approach to meet some of its emission reduction goal in combination with emission standards on affected EGUs. Or it could rely entirely on the state measures to meet its goal. The disadvantage of this approach, in my view, is that a state proposing state measures must demonstrate that its state measures will achieve the emission reductions on a schedule, and it must describe how the emission reductions will be verified. And the state must also agree 
that if the state measures don't do the job, the federally enforceable emission standards will be imposed as a backstop. So the bottom line uh, is that a state RPS can help a state meet its emission reduction goals as a complementary measure in the background or explicitly as a state measure. Uh, next slide, please. So we, when we talk about RPS, just about any presentation has a, a map that shows uh, each of the RPS states and what their target is and, and certain facts about each, each one of them. In this map, um, I want to focus on states from, uh, from the perspective of when they reach their maximum requirement. There are 17 state RPSs that reach their zenith before the Clean Power Plan compliance period even begins in 2022. These states in particular should examine whether they're likely to meet their CPP emission reduction goals without any further effort and whether to take any action with respect to their RPS. These states have a choice. They can, they can let their RPS maintain its maximum level indefinitely or let it sunset if, they, if the RPS law ends abruptly. Or they can strengthen their RPS to make it easier to meet their CPP emission reduction goals. Other states without an RPS may want to consider adopting a new RPS as a proven policy, but they could also stimulate more renewable energy by other means, such as competitive solicitations for new renewable energy projects. Uh, and I should also point out here that the light blue states that don't have a date on them, these are states with an RPS, but their RPS continues well into, or in some cases beyond, the CPP compliance period. Uh, more broadly, I think the, the choice depends, the choice uh, that a state makes with respect to its RPS and CPP compliance, it depends on how a, how it, a state believes that it can best meet its CPP targets. For example, states could also encourage more energy efficiency. The, and the affected EGUs themselves will likely be motivated to increase plant efficiencies or perhaps a switch from coal to natural gas. But fundamentally, under either uh, mass-based or rate-based state plans, state RPSs can continue to operate as they have done previously. States may want to increase their RPS targets if necessary to help displace affected EGUs and thereby reduce overall emissions but they don't have to attribute the reduced emissions to a particular policy unless they claim the RPS as a state measure. Let's go to the next slide, please. There are a couple other things that I want to highlight for state consideration. Uh, the first is whether a state wants its RPS to help the state meet its Clean Power Plan emission reduction goals or whether it wants its RPS to create incremental emission reductions above what the CPP requires. This is something that Todd spoke about earlier. It's a relevant question because some states have adopted their RPSs explicitly to reduce carbon emissions or to mitigate climate change. Uh, there are several options for states that want to pursue this path. Mass-based states that, that uh, distribute allowances they could set aside allowances equivalent to the renewable energy counted toward an RPS. These allowances could be retired and thereby effectively lowering the cap by the amount of emission reductions attributable to the RPS. Rate-based states with an incremental RPS could require that the entities complying with the RPS must acquire and retire an ERC as well as a REC used for RPS compliance. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but essentially the state should consider carefully the role it wants its RPS to play, either in helping to meet the, the CPP goals or in achieving even more emission reductions. The second issue that I want to speak about uh, relates to tracking systems. As part of their state plans, states will have to decide how they'll track ERCs or allowances. Tracking systems are also key to verifying state RPS compliance, so it's worth spending just a minute exploring the potential interaction. One option is for states to designate an existing state or regional certificate tracking system that their renewable generators and utilities are already using for tracking RECs for RPS compliance. 
EPA would have to approve this tracking system. The other main option is for states to select a tracking system that EPA will develop and administer by itself. I think the tracking choice will be influenced by whether a state proposes a rate-based plan or a mass-based plan, because a rate-based plan relies on reported megawatt hours for the creation of ERCs, just as existing tracking systems do for the creation of RECs. By comparison, mass-based states will rely on allowances, which are not dependent on megawatt hours for their creation. They're created based on the mass emissions budget, or CAP. So if a state needs to track ERCs, uh, I think it would be advantageous to go with an existing REC tracking system, because the same generation data should be used to create both ERCs and RECs. The generation data would have to be submitted to the administrator of the tracking system and verified only once. Plus, uh, maintaining and managing accounts in two different tracking systems would impose extra costs on generators and market participants, such as utilities, that want both ERCs and RECs, not to mention the burden on uh, voluntary renewable energy buyers. If a state wants to track allowances, that could be done by any tracking system, but the EPA-administered system or an existing allowance tracking system might have the advantage because, as, as I said earlier, allowance creation and distribution isn't based on generation, so there's no natural affinity for allowances to be tracked by existing REC tracking systems. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Dave uh, to uh, help us make a transition. Thank you very much, Ed. So folks, up to this point, um, we've endeavored to set the stage for you. We've looked at the Clean Power Plan. We've looked at voluntary markets for renewable energy, regulatory markets for renewable energy, and how they might interact. What we're going to do is change direction slightly here. Todd and Ed are going to offer some general guidance to the states. So Todd, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Dave. So my first piece of guidance, um, and this follows from the first part of my presentation, is to do no harm uh, to the voluntary market. So next slide. So um, these maps show that the voluntary renewable energy market is important in every state, either to supply the voluntary market or as a source of demand for voluntary renewable energy. Um, these are sales of renewable energy that stand apart from compliance efforts. So reducing you know, the greenhouse gas emissions um, benefits of voluntary renewable energy purchasers, uh, we hope is a policy outcome that, that states will agree is, is unacceptable. Um, you know, these sales represent individual business and nonprofit investment in renewable power that promise to uh, reduce actual emissions, not simply make it cheaper for compliance entities to comply with their clean power plan target. And this market is really driven by large corporate buyers. So we're not just talking about residential or individual grid customers. There are thousands of companies, including the largest uh, Fortune 500 companies that are buying green power in the voluntary market. While the RPS has gotten a lot of well-deserved recognition for driving renewable energy development and while sales for the RPS have really ramped up in recent years, the voluntary market, you know, was the dominant force for building renewable energy in this country for many years and continues to be a major uh, driver for, for new development. Um, earlier, I made the distinction, and I want to go back to it for just a second, between um, disaggregation and double counting between ERCs or allowances and, and RECs and, um, and concerns around the impact uh, of voluntary renewable energy purchases uh, on greenhouse gas emissions and the loss of what we call regulatory surplus. So again, while voluntary REC buyers will not be losing their claims and benefits, and the RPS can still deliver unique, fully aggregated megawatt hours of renewable energy, so there's no disaggregation, they may lose a part of their historical impact on grid emissions. So their generation will not avoid emissions as, uh, at, a regu at regulated units beyond what is required for the clean power plan. And that's true in both mass and rate-based states. Uh, so 
if states do not restore regulatory surplus for the voluntary market, then as we said, demand in the voluntary market may suffer. The market may shrink, and and that would not only be bad for renewable energy, but um, uh, in that case, you know, the states have lost any additional clean power plan compliance in the voluntary market that the voluntary market would have provided anyway. Uh, so next next slide. So this just shows the, the, the growth of the voluntary market according to the latest um, NREL report uh, using 2014 data. Voluntary retail sales of renewable energy were totaling about 74 million megawatt hours per year, representing about 2% of total US electricity sales and growing at about 10% per year. And there were about 5 million customers purchasing green power in the voluntary market each year. So specifically, we're recommending that states design their clean power plans, state plans, to support and enhance and not undercut existing renewable energy markets and the voluntary market, and motivating more businesses to invest in clean energy with their private funds. And this means, in rate-based states, setting requirements around ERC issuance, trading, and use that allow voluntary renewable energy purchasers to reduce carbon emissions, uh, emissions below the level of, uh, of their 111D state target. Uh, for example, by keeping ERCs and RECs bundled together or preventing the issuance of ERCs uh, for renewable energy that serves the voluntary market. And in mass-based states, uh, it means including an allowance set aside for voluntary renewable energy, reducing the level of the emissions cap or retiring allowances to account for voluntary renewable energy transactions, following California's and the red regional greenhouse gas initiatives uh, lead. So next slide. So the next piece of guidance is to comment on the federal plan and the model rules that have been proposed by EPA. Uh, there's a lot to comment on in the federal plan, potentially, um, but our most important comment, for example, uh, will be that uh, it, it should include uh, a voluntary renewable energy set aside if the federal plan is mass-based and in the mass-based model rule. Um, we will also comment that uh, some mechanisms should be included to, pre to, uh, to prevent the use of ERCs for compliance for voluntary renewable energy in the rate-based model rule and if the federal plan is, is rate-based. Uh, you know, other comments could include you know, allocating allowances to renewable energy just in general and that's uh, that's included in the federal proposed federal plan already for the purposes of preventing uh, leakage, uh, but this also allows renewable energy to sell its value in the market rather than simply losing that value or having that value transferred to emitting plants in the case of um, mass-based compliance. And we can talk more about the federal plan if you like in the Q&A section. Um, and I will turn it over to Ed. Okay, thanks Todd. Uh, I want to continue with the um, this idea of general guidance for states with a little bit of a summary of some of the things I spoke about earlier. Uh, the, the third uh, point is that states should think about the role they want their RPS to play in CPP compliance. Uh, is it going to be complementary? Is it going to be uh, uh, incremental? And this also involves a threshold decision, I think, of whether a state wants a rate-based plan involving ERCs or a mass-based plan involving allowances. That uh, it's going to take uh, states could take states in different directions with respect to their uh, to renewable energy and their RPS. Uh, fourth point is for states to consider whether their RPS is robust enough to motivate the clean energy they'll need to meet the CPP. Do they need to extend their RPS and increase their renewable energy targets? Uh, this also play, applies to states that don't have an RPS. Do they need help in meeting their emission reduction goal? Now is, a, is the time for them to be thinking about these questions. And the fifth point is regarding tracking systems again. States should be consulting with the certificate tracking systems they're already using, either about allowance or ERC tracking options. And by states, I mean not just the utility commissions that already have some familiarity with these tracking systems, but more critically, the air regulators who are in the lead for the development of the state's clean power plan. These conversations should begin immediately, in my view, and these parties should keep talking until each state is clear whether it wants a rate-based plan or a mass-based plan. 
and I, I'm aware that some discussions have already begun, and I think that's a, a very good sign. I just, I just think more of it needs to happen faster. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dave for some concluding comments. Thank you, Ed. Uh, folks, so we've set out a handful of conclusions on this slide, as you can see, for you to consider. Uh, what I want to do is just highlight several. The first is that the, the clean power plan is going to create generation-based carbon markets that could interact with currently operating renewable energy markets. Because renewable energy contributes to avoiding CO2 emissions, these new clean power plan markets in the existing renewable energy markets are going to require careful coordination. And the good news is that mechanisms exist to ensure that this can happen effectively and that states can create robust clean power plan state plans and continue to benefit from the nation's growing um, renewable energy investment. Next slide, please. For more detail, uh, because this has been um, a, a quick run through some complicated material, if you're feeling frustrated, that's okay. I'm not surprising. This is pretty detailed stuff. But for more detail, look at... Um, uh, I, I encourage you to take a look at a couple of papers that Todd has put together from CRS and also a paper that Ed has put together. Todd's looking at um, the clean power plan with an emphasis as, as we've seen here in this webinar on voluntary markets and Ed is looking at um, the role of, of RPSs. Uh, next slide please. So what we're going to do now is take a, uh, take a look at some of your questions. Um, Ed, here's one for you. Um, if possible, can you address how RPS markets with existing REC trading may change under a multi-state or a regional plan? Uh, sure. I, I guess the um, uh, my, my, my first thought is that uh, because they, they use different instruments, that is, the Clean Power Plan uses ERCs or, or allowances and uh, uh, RPS markets use uh, uh, use RECs that because they're different there's uh, interstate trade of RECs for RPS compliance doesn't really need to change at all. Uh, let me maybe I can give an example. Uh, assume that um, uh, say uh, Minnesota is a rate-based state. For clean power per plan purposes it could establish linkages with you know far-flung states like Washington and Florida and trade IRCs with them. But for its RPS, Minnesota will accept RECs from any generator that's registered in the tracking system uh, called the MRETs, or the Midwest uh, Renewable Energy Tracking System. And so because IRCs and RECs are separate instruments used for different purposes, there is no real conflict. Um, I could give you, two, you know, s several other examples, but I think you get the idea that they, that they really are uh, there's, there's no, adding a new compliance market does not impose a limit on REC trading for RPS compliance. Thank you, Ed. I have a follow-up question for you, um, one from Rachel Evans, and this is related to your answer here. She says, many states already require sellers of RECs to certify that those RECs retain all attributes, including avoided emissions. Isn't that a state-by-state -state determination? Um, states have their own definitions for uh, for for RECs. What what attributes must be included? Many of them are general definitions that say uh, all renewable you know, or all environmental attributes. Uh, some others um, may be more explicit and say must include uh, emission uh, emission rate uh, information attributes and and uh, then there are some states that may say it does not have to include that uh, so that that is correct that there are that this, the individual um, states have their own de definitions but I think as Todd uh, mentioned earlier in his his presentation uh, this uh, you know, we don't really see uh, a conflict between ERCs and Rex putting claims on the same uh, same attribute because, uh, or except to the extent that maybe one is being, one, the avoided emissions attribute may be claimed for consumption, whereas the, uh, it may, in the clean power plan it may be uh, claimed for uh, generation. 
so I don't really see much of a conflict there, but I'd like to give Todd a chance to uh, respond to that as well. No, I, I, I agree with you, Ed, there. Um, yeah, to the extent that, I think the point is that to the extent that the, that the state defines the, the REC as including all environmental attributes or even explicitly says, you know, all environmental attributes including avoided emissions, that that state definition and, for, and, and in the voluntary markets, so that, that is the, the, you know, including fully aggregated, you know, all, all environmental attributes including avoided grid emissions is, for example, what the Green E uh, certification program uses for, um, for the voluntary market. The, that definition would not uh, need to change necessarily as a result of the Clean Power Plan, as I tried to point out, and there's more detail on this in the, in the papers that, that Dave mentioned. Um, we're, we're drawing a distinction between you know, disaggregating RECs um, and, and the effect that, so we don't think that there's disaggregation of those, those attributes by, uh, by ERCs or these new instruments um, or, or other markets that develop under the Clean Power Plan. Um, but there could be an impact to uh, to, to the impact uh, to the yeah the, the impact of of, um, of renewable energy markets, including the voluntary market, to the extent that 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 attribute is is now used for compliance. Thanks, Todd. Um, Todd, I have a follow up question for you. Um, so you discussed how ERCs are traded and how the the value the emissions value associated with ERCs. Um, is recognized. I have a question here that gets to this again, and I and I think uh, there's no problem at all hearing these uh, these points reiterated multiple times. Uh, the question comes from Stephanie Morse. She says a few states are not required to submit clean power plan compliance plans, and two in particular are called out as eligible compliance mechanisms: Vermont and Washington D.C. If these jurisdictions were to create and sell ERCs or allowances to an EGU in a clean power plan state, how will the value of those credits be measured? There are no avoided emissions within that state to measure against. Well, um, so the, 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 the clean power plan, the, the preamble, the final rule, does say that uh, ERCs can be issued for qualifying measures that are located in a state with no uh, no emissions reductions obligations. So for example, Vermont, provided that they are connected to the contiguous U.S. grid and and meet other requirements for eligibility, um, and and so you know as with renewable energy located in a mass-based state, in order to issue ERCs from that renewable energy in those areas, it has to be demonstrated that the generation was delivered to the to to the grid to meet electricity load in the state with a rate-based plan. So those uh, those those resources could potentially uh, generate ERCs and participate. In which case, uh, they would. Um, those ERCs would represent the same uh, avoided uh, emissions value to affected EGUs participating or regulated in other states as any other ERCs. Uh, Does that Dave, answer the question? Dave, let, let me try to chime in on this a little bit because I think the, the key point for, let's say, a, a renewable energy generator in Vermont or in D.C. That, that wants to be issued ERCs and sell them, the key point is that those ERCs are used to adjust uh, the emission rate in the state where they are used. So uh, the Vermont generator would be selling their ERCs to a, some other state that does have a compliance need, and it's that state that is where, where it's being used that would make the adjustment to its emission rate. Yeah, that's right. So the, the avoided emissions that occur on the grid as a result of renewable energy generation, essentially, you know, you can think about them as they occur where they occur. Um, but in order to report, in order for uh, the, the fossil unit that is regulated, um, that is actually the, where their generation is actually displaced, where those avoided emissions actually occur on the grid, in order for that unit to report uh, for the purposes of the Clean Power Plan a reduced rate, uh, or to report that reduced generation for compliance, they need an ERC now. So that is uh, that is the value of an ERC, and the fact that ERCs are tradable means that those that that avoided grid emission uh, effect of renewable energy generation is is tradable. So um, where those where those avoided emissions occur on the grid, if that uh, that facility uh, where the emissions are actually displaced. 
uh, has the IRC, then they can report it. And if they don't have the IRC, then they can't. Whoever owns the IRC can report that. So that that's what is uh, in, in included in an IRC. Thanks, Todd. Uh, question for Ed. Uh, Ed, can you explain how the, the CEIP, the Clean Energy um, um, uh, Investment Plan, I haven't got that correct. Incentive Program. Incentive Program, thank you. The CEIP, can you explain how the allocations for renewables work there? And um, is, there any, is there a meaningful interaction between those allocations and the production tax credit? Yeah, okay, this is, um, I think maybe I, I need to give a little bit of a overview of what the Clean Energy Incentive Program is first. It's, it's really intended to provide an in incentives for early action, uh, specifically investment in certain renewable energy and, and demand side energy efficiency projects. For renewables, the CEIP is available for wind and solar projects only. And they have to commence construction following the submission of a final state plan to EPA or after September uh, 2018. Uh, the CEIP is also available to energy efficiency projects in low-income communities that commence operation after a final state plan is submitted. And the eligible, uh, just to, another, there are several wrinkles to this, uh, the eligible renewable energy and energy efficiency projects must generate megawatt hours or, or reduce end use en energy demand during the years 2020 and or 2021. So just for the two years prior to the first compliance year. Uh, state participation in the CEIP is optional. So states must declare their intent to participate in their final plan. And uh, participation is, is uh, possible regardless of what type of a plan a state chooses to implement. For the CEIP, uh, EPA will set aside 300 million short tons, uh, or e equivalent IRCs or allowances, and then allocate to them, them to states that include provision for the CEIP. So the, the incentive is that the wind or solar projects, for example, can earn extra IRCs or allowances if they, uh, if they begin uh, construction after the final plan is submitted and if they then generate during that two-year window. The, the, to, to sp specifically then to the questions, uh, the, the, this pool of 300 million short tons uh, will be allocated to the participating states based on a pro rata share. That shares will be based on the amount of emission reductions from the, that each state is required to achieve rel, uh, from 2012 levels uh, to, uh, I believe, the 2030 uh, endpoint. So uh, states whose EGUs have greater reduction obligations, they'll be eligible to get a larger proportion of the federal matching pool. And the proposed federal rule has actually has a table for the proposed allocation to each state, assuming that they all participate. And this is up for comment. Uh, the other question was specifically about interaction with the production tax credit, uh, assuming that the PTC is renewed and extended. Uh, this isn't limited to IRCs or allowances awarded under the CEIP. It could be IRCs or allowances that are issued under the under the uh, during the during the compliance period, but the, I think the question is asked because the PTC has anti-double dipping provisions that apply primarily to other federal tax credits, upfront cash grants, and uh, subsidized financing. So this is a little bit of speculation on my part, but uh, because IRCs or allowances are awarded over time, uh, not upfront. Um, and, and, they're not, and it's based on actual production, much like the PTC itself, then probably a project would not lose its PTC if it also earns IRCs or allowances. We should also remember, I think as, a, as an example, that PTC projects already receive RECs without consequence for the amount of tax credit they get. So the same would probably be true for IRCs or allowances issued under the CPP. 
Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. Well, everybody, we've come to the end of our, our 60 minutes. As I mentioned, we're going to go another 30 minutes um, beyond uh, to continue answering questions, but I wanted to just formally close up the um, uh, close up uh, the webinar. As, as you all can see, um, um, we've provided um, some uh, uh, some final thoughts up here that I'd like you to, uh, to consider. You know, as we've endeavored to demonstrate, um, renewable energy can play a key part in a clean power plant state plan. And states can design plans that will allow them to continue to take advantage of the many benefits of clean energy that uh, regulatory and voluntary renewable energy markets have produced in the past and can continue to provide Integration solutions are available, and successful states will need to engage in consultation and coordination with renewable energy tracking systems to ensure that these programs uh, work effectively. With that, I think we are timed out at the hour, end of the hour, but um, we're going to say goodbye and um, just for a second and then come back. If you have more questions, you can see the... Uh, Everybody's uh, contact information there. I know um, Ed and Todd and I would, would be happy to hear from you and answer questions that we don't get to, that we didn't get to in the first 60 minutes or that we may not get to um, in the next 30. But thank you for your attendance. Okay, over time. Here we go. I've got a question for Todd. Um, Todd, do you have practical advice for rate-based states that want to maintain a voluntary carve-out? This is from Chip Wood. Um, yes. So uh, we, you know, we were, we were, um, we we continue to to work with our partners and with with states to to uh, you know as they develop their plans and those plans become more specific, um, and the, you know the details of those plans evolve to develop sort of state specific solutions or plan specific solutions um, for you know for protecting the volu vo protecting voluntary demand however you know like I said in the presentation um, for for rate based states uh, in particular uh, the you know what we're saying is for for voluntary renewable energy um, renewable energy that's sold in the voluntary market for those megawatt hours um, Preventing ERCs uh, that are that are generated for those megawatt hours from being used by uh, for compliance by uh, by affected EGUs. So effectively retiring those ERCs on behalf of the voluntary market in a sort of ERC set aside, and in very much the same way that that uh, that an allowance set aside would work in a mass based state. Um, so uh, so. You know, if that that effectively you know pairs a, a the the ERCs um, uh, that are generated for the clean power plan with RECs that are being sold in the voluntary market, um, so that the the voluntary buyers um, uh, know that they're that the, that that renewable energy the the void emissions on the grid associated with that renewable energy aren't in fact being counted uh, for compliance. Um, with the clean power plan, and and that would mean that that restores that regulatory surplus. They are going uh, above and beyond uh, what is required for GHG emissions at affected units, um, and and sort of maintains the the historical impact of of this market. Uh, so that's what we we would recommend. We're also going to be um, providing some guidance uh, uh, for comments on the federal plan and the model rules, the proposed federal plan and model rules that have been issued. By by the EPA, and those comments again are due on January 21st. But we will be sending out uh, some guidance for all stakeholders who are commenting on that plan uh, in terms of what they can include in their comments to uh, preserve that uh, that impact of the voluntary market. Thank you, Todd. Um, Ed, uh, we have a question from Ann McCabe. Uh, what are the possible ERC tracking systems? For example, MRATS Climate Registry. Well, when I when I was speaking about um, the existing rec tracking systems, I had in mind uh, there are about uh, nine or ten of them that cover the country. Uh, see if I can rattle them off. One is the Western Renewable Energy Generation Information System, or Regis, that covers uh, most of the Western interconnect. Uh, another is the Midwest uh, Renewable Energy Tracking System, or MRETS. Uh, the Texas system, which is run by ERCOT, um, 
the um, a couple of state systems. Uh, Michigan has one, and uh, NC rats for North Carolina. Uh, New York has one that uh, will be ready to go live here in uh, uh, just a few months. Uh, then there's the New England Generation Information System and the uh, PJM uh, Generation EIS uh, PJM EIS uh, uh, Generation Attribute Tracking System or GATS. And then there's also one uh, called uh, the North American Renewables Registry. So I was thinking about those because they they are the ones that are already having generation data reported to them. Uh, tracking systems for other instruments that are not based on on generation uh, may also be good candidates to consider for. Um, Say allowance tracking, um, and and uh, but I think it would be a stretch for them to take on uh, the job of of uh, reporting generation and creating RECs and ERCs. I don't know if that do you think that answers the question. I think you did a nice job covering that. Yeah, thank you. I have another one for you. Um, do you have a sense of which states might seek to strengthen their RPS or voluntary markets to make the emissions reductions incremental to CPP compliance? rather than complementary? That's Don Reeves' question. Yeah, a, a, good, a good question, and I have a short answer, and that is no, I don't really. Or I actually, I have a couple of uh, inklings from conversations that I've, that I've had, but I don't want to name states because I don't want to imply that that's a direction that they are heading. There are some states, though, that, that will think about it. I, I suspect most states may not go that way, but uh, but there are a few states who are really uh, who, who feel some importance that their RPS is trying to create additional uh, additional emissions impact. Okay, thank you. This is a question for for either of you. Um, if a state is about to encounter the closing of a nuclear power plant, with that generation being replaced by low cost but carbon emitting gas generation. Do you have any policy guidance for those states to meet clean power plan requirements? Todd, why don't you start? Ed, you go next. Well, I mean that's uh, that's a more general uh, question than you know than, than the sort of focused conversation we've been having about renewable energy. But yeah, so you know they would they would essentially be replacing uh, non non emitting for the purposes of the clean power plan non emitting uh, generation with emitting generation um, that that new you know uh, natural gas unit would actually not be regulated under uh, 111d of the uh, of of the Clean Air Act um, and the Clean Power Plan because it would be considered a new a new unit uh, so. Um, so you know, it, depending on what their so their their mass effectively um, would not uh, their their mass or their their rate that's regulated by the Clean Power Plan wouldn't uh, wouldn't actually change as a result of that. Um, Ed, yeah, yeah, that's a it's a that's a good distinction that you make, Todd, in pointing out that uh, new generation uh, would not be covered by the Clean Power Plan. However, if uh, if you weren't looking at new generation, you you still you could rely on additional energy efficiency or additional uh, renewable energy to uh, uh, to try to you know to have a uh, uh, a bigger impact on the emissions uh, goals that have been set out for you. I don't really uh, if if EPA has set targets that don't take into account or don't anticipate the closing of, say, a large uh, non-emitting plant like a, a, a nuclear plant, um, if they have not already taken that into account, then I, I don't really, I guess I don't really know uh, how to respond, but um, except to the extent that if you're, if you're replacing it with uh, new emitting stuff, mainly gas, that would not be under this plant. plant. Right, and, and Ed, that's an uh, you know I just assumed that the that the new that the gas that it was replacing the nuclear was new. I guess it could be that you know that they're just ramping up other sources to um, 
or incre increasing generation at other sources, other existing sources that could be regulated under the Clean Power Plan to make up for the loss of that uh, capacity from the nuclear plant, in which case, you know, their their mass emissions would increase, um, or, or you know, and and so, you know, any of the any of the number of uh, of emission reducing activities that that the Clean Power Plan talks about um, that would be uh, eligible for ERCs in a rate-based system or that could potentially affect a mass in a mass-based system uh, would would be approaches that the state would need to take in order to meet uh, in order to meet its target. Uh, so you know, and and that extends beyond the three building blocks that were used in by the EPA in setting in setting its targets. No, that's those are those are great points. I'd also uh, the the question didn't include necessarily new resources. The distinction that you both have made. New resources would come in under 111B as in boy, and we're talking about 111D as in dog. Um, but if that state, that uh, if that uh, hypothetical that Mr. Harris describes involved new generation, this is precisely the the uh, the scenario that EPA considers when it's uh, in in articulating a concern about leakage. So if you have new resources coming in. Um, and being subject to um, the 111B boy program for new resources, then um, those those sources can be drawn upon, and and as Todd pointed out, the emissions will increase, and you have a, a scene where a scenario where leakage occurs, and this is something that EPA is requiring um, states that go mass based to ensure uh, does not happen. Thank you for your answer um, for those. Uh, Todd, Avi Zevin has asked, if corporate buyers want to be additional, why can't they buy and retire the IRCs associated with the power? They could. Um, or, or they, you know, it, it, Depending on what we ultimately see, you know, what sort of national market for ERC ex ERCs exists, and how states set up their their um, their programs in terms of ERC issuance and trading and accounts and registries and those sorts of things, um, you know, th there will be intermediaries in the market, and undoubtedly, and there could be sort of a voluntary market for for ERCs, even though there's no voluntary value necessarily beyond the value of keeping those ERCs out of a circulation for compliance, um, which we could see, and we could uh, see some, you know, voluntary products that bundle ERCs and RECs together specifically to uh, to address this this loss of regulatory surplus or the effect of the clean power plan that we we talked about today. So uh, that could happen, um, and uh, and it remains to be seen, I guess, the you know what uh, what those products look like, what the voluntary market will do in response to whatever the states, uh, what whatever the states ultimately decide at this point what we're saying is that uh, the states can take action and should take action uh, from our perspective to to protect voluntary demand by um, by setting up these you know these set asides whether it's for for ERCs, uh, to retire ERCs on behalf of the voluntary market or to retire allowances on behalf of the voluntary market and and that means that um, uh, that would, the state would be taking that action on, on behalf of the voluntary market, uh, rather than voluntary buyers having to go out and uh, and um, and procure ERCs or allowances. But for example, you could look at you know the existing set asides under California and the Regional Greenhouse Gas uh, Initiative in the Northeast. So they include those programs include a voluntary set aside of of allowances that that automatically retires allowances, uh, takes allowances off the top of the cap on behalf of the voluntary market. And so, um, you know where where those programs are in place. Uh, that that means that voluntary buyers in those areas uh, can continue to purchase renewable energy without having to go out and procure their own allowances and pair those allowances with with their rec. So um, those are hugely beneficial state state programs. So that's what we're we're advising. You know, at this point, that's the guidance we're providing at this point. That those programs should be in place. Short of that, if those programs aren't put in place, uh, and voluntary buyers still want that regulatory surplus value for their voluntary action with respect to greenhouse gas emissions at affected units, then um, then they would go out and on their own procure ERCs or allowances, as the case may be. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Ed, Paul Alvarez uh, wrote the following question. He said, Ed, you mentioned that state measures 
are not allowed in rate-based CPPs. However, I know I've seen in the EPA EM&V guidance document how efficiency and renewable energy megawatt hours are added to the rate-based emissions calculation at zero pounds of CO2. Can you explain this discrepancy? Uh, yes. Um, uh, efficiency and renewable energy, they can be issued ERCs, and, they, and ERCs can be used to, uh, uh, in a, uh, a rate-based plan to adjust the emission rates. Uh, so they are, um, uh, but but it's still in in that situation. It's still a an emission standards approach where it's the affected EGU that has to comply. Uh, it's up to the affected EGU to acquire these ERCs that can be used for adjusting their rate uh, from the uh, energy efficiency or or renewable energy generators. State measures are you know, they, they can't, state measures can be based on the same things. They can be based on energy efficiency programs or renewable energy programs that are undertaken under state law, and which take on a responsibility that those those entities that are responsible for uh, implementing that state law um, they have to actually achieve the emission reductions through those measures and demonstrate that in a very rigorous way. Uh, but that's different. That's a different means of achieving the goal uh, than, um, than being issued ERCs, which are used by the affected EGUs. So in the, in the state measures approach, the, the uh, affected EGUs don't have to acquire anything. In fact, it, it's easier for them to meet their you know, the burden on them, the rate may actually be easier for them to achieve because there's this energy efficiency or renewable energy that's, that's uh, being undertaken under state law that results in uh, achieving some of the emission reduction. Thank you, Ed. So we've gotten several questions, one from uh, Bill Drumheller and another from Alex Sheets, um, that um, go to concern about uh, double counting or disaggregating uh, mm -hmm. carbon from um, the the bundle of attributes associated with a wreck. So I'm going to read Bill's, but uh, Alex had a similar question. I'm having difficulty buying the argument that there isn't double counting between ERCs and RECs using the greenhouse gas scope accounting metaphor. By definition, all scope two emissions are someone's, are someone's scope one emissions. Therefore, at least at the macro scale, that would be double counting. So we're kind of winding down here, Todd. I just wondered if you can give a, a sort of a quick, succinct lightning round kind of response to that question. Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, so to the extent that I, under I understand what's being asked, um, yeah, double scope two uh, emissions are the direct scope one emissions of, of someone else. So that's not double counting those scope one emissions. The total, the, the total amount of uh, emissions is the, the sum total of everyone's scope one. We calculate scope two and scope three as indirect emissions in order to get a better idea of what, of what folks' footprint are. But if we were calculating the total uh, emissions, it would be the sum of all scope one. So, by by making a claim, making a scope two claim, uh, you know, which is emissions associated with electricity, those are emissions that are that are someone else's scope one emissions that you're claiming some indirect responsibility for. So, um, so yeah, the the analogy that I drew between uh, between an ERC and a REC and an, and a REC representing a consumption claim or a scope two claim, um, uh, you know that and and an ERC representing a generation claim or a, you know a scope one claim. Uh, there's no double counting between scopes. There's double counting within scopes, but not between scopes. And so that was the uh, that was the point I was I was making. But there is more information in the. Um, and more explanation of this specific question about scope two accounting uh, in the second of the two papers that we released. And of course, you can contact me afterwards. Thank you, um, Todd. Uh, Matt Friedman has a question for you, Ed. If 
a mass-based state relies on an RPS program for achieving CPP goals, wouldn't it be difficult to realize any specific CPP compliance value for that state if utilities procure renewable energy from facilities located in other mass-based states? Um, uh, Dave, I'm going to have to ask you to read that again. Okay. Uh, if, if it both, both situations were mass-based? If a mass-based state relies on an RPS program for achieving clean power plan goals, wouldn't it be difficult to realize any specific compliance value for the clean power plan, compliance value for that state, if utilities procure renewable energy from facilities located in other mass-based states? Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm really understanding it, I guess, but I, you know, these are uh, other, both, both sets of states are mass-based, so they're both using allowances for uh, compliance. Allowances are totally tradable, you know, to the extent that states have established linkages with other mass-based states or if they're trading ready than any, any other uh, mass-based state. So, and, and we're looking at a, you know, a, a, there's, a, there's a fixed amount of uh, allowances that are made available based on the emission caps. So it's, I don't know, it seems to me that there's, uh, uh, even if you, if you use a, 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 an allowance that came from some other state, um, that is helping to reduce the overall U.S. cap, or not the cap, but uh, it re reduce uh, or avoid uh, a certain amount of emissions overall. Um, but maybe I'm not getting it. If you, Todd or Dave, you, you have a, a no, I, please do. Uh, this is Todd. So um, you know, I I think I think what the question is is asking is you know, or or. Uh, pointing out is that to have a maximum impact, uh, you know, the RPS renewables for the for the clean power plan to have a, a maximum impact, the RPS renewables should primarily displace in-state affected units, um, and uh, I think that's what the question is is pointing out. RPSs are going to affect state clean power plan compliance. They can even be integrated into state measures plans. Um, but to have maximum impact uh, in, on that mass, the RPS renewables should primarily displace in-state in affected units. And so to the extent that states are developing these plans, they have to you know, uh, predict you know, the effect of their RPS. And if it's a state measures plan, they have to report in their state plan how they think the RPS will help them meet their clean power plan. If, uh, if the RPS renewables or the renewables serving the RPS are, are located out of state or, or they're dis at least they're displacing uh, emissions out of state, then they won't get as much value for the clean power plan as they would if they were affecting or displacing in-state affected units. So, and, and, and it can be hard to predict uh, where those RPS renewables are going to be uh, displacing um, uh, emissions, and 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 it'll sort of uh, depend on eligibility uh, from the RPS program as well as sort of what the regional grid looks like. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. I think that okay. I'm, I'm sort of picking up on that. I think it's a strategic decision then. If, st if states uh, want to make sure that the uh, the the renewable energy and the displacement is occurring closer to home, then, then in, in their mass-based plan, uh, they can establish what other states they will uh, agree to trade with. And it's, uh, you know, it, so, so the states have some control over that in the, in when, they, when they write their plan. Yeah, and also when they, you know, they could potentially adjust their RPS uh, eligibility rules to address that as well, or you know, maximize the the benefits of a of a multi-state plan, or at least multi-state coordination. If they have RPSs, if there are m multiple states with RPSs that um, that include uh, renewables from out of state. Right. Great. So we have time probably for a couple more questions. I have this one for you, Todd. Uh, Kevin DeGroat has asked, is there any possibility of a state proposing a measure involving emissions reductions from vehicles by pursuing an EV program? Um, 
Has EPA considered any relaxation of the boundaries of where reductions occur? Oh, goodness. Um, so uh, my understanding is that uh, you know there there are minimum requirements for for ERC issuance uh, that that must be met. Uh, beyond that, you know there uh, and 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 you know obviously you can get reductions uh, to to a mass from anywhere, especially if it's a if it's a, a performance emissions performance plan. Um, then you know those those are emissions limits emission performance levels that are set for the affected units, and it doesn't really matter where those. Uh, where those reductions come from. So a state can implement any number of, of different programs to try and reduce their, their mass emissions, including, um, you know, um, uh, including, I guess, uh, uh, an electric vehicles program. However, you know, I, there, I've, I've heard recent uh, conversations just um, <laughs> just anecdotally about the potential effect of, of uh, the electrification of transportation systems to, you know, potentially increase uh, load and and um, increase uh, mass emissions, um, you know, uh, just just as a uh, a result of again, sort of an uh, uh, elect increased electrification of of transportation. So. I'm not sure that that um, I'm not sure that that would reduce uh, mass emissions. Um, in fact, you know, increased uh, electrification of transportation may uh, result in more demand for electricity and and may require um, more more electricity. I'm not sure how substantial you know that difference is at this point. Um, That's a, uh, I, I see your point. So you're suggesting it cuts the other way. It's potentially well, very substantial, I would, I would assume. But I think it's also important to that, that perhaps the battery capacity associated with a, a, a big EV program might help, um, might help in uh, further integrating renewables and in that there might be some um, emissions benefits associated with that. But um, what we've oh right, I mean, yeah, we've gotten some other questions about you know um, electricity storage and things too, and the effect the effect of of storage on clean power plant compliance. And you're right to the extent that you know you're using batteries or or, or EVs, and and stop me if I'm getting off topic topic, but um, you know it, to the extent that you're increasing storage you know dramatically, you know, and that avoids generation at affected units. Um, then, then you are helping meet your clean power plan goals for sure. Yep. One last question here for for Ed. Uh, this from Glenn Blackman. Ed. Um, he said Ed's suggestion that a state retire allowance is equal to the emissions avoided by the RPS seems unrealistic. Our state's emissions budget is lower than it otherwise would be because of the renewable energy that is required by the RPS. To lower the budget again for this generation is unreasonable. Maybe there's a little clarification required there, um, Ed. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't necessarily uh, disagree with Glenn on that. I mean, I think that um, the likelihood of states uh, recommending or proposing that uh, their RPS programs will be incremental. Uh, and how, how they might go about doing that uh, is just the mechanics of it. But trying to, to, to have their RPS have a bigger impact when it will uh, likely increase the overall cost, you know, I, I don't see that happening on a large scale. But I wanted to put it out there uh, because I have heard, as I said, I've heard uh, uh, some states uh, uh, talk about this in a, in a uh, in, in a speculative way, and so I wanted to put the uh, put the idea out there, but uh, I'm not necessarily advocating it for it one way or the other. And this is Todd. I'll I'll just add that you know that I agree with that that there could be uh, good reasons that states have to choose to make their RPS programs incremental with respect to greenhouse gas emissions that affected units. For you know, for, uh, under the clean power plan. So um, while certain states may feel that that's an, an unreasonable burden uh, to place on states that are trying to comply, uh, it does depend, as Ed said, on what other emissions reductions options that state has. And and um, and like I said, there could be very good reasons depending on how uh, 
what the intent of the RPS was, if it was to create uh, emissions reductions, and those emissions reductions are now um, helping support rather than uh, support the clean power plan. You know, so those are those are not emissions reductions that would be additive in any way. Then the state may feel if they have other emissions reductions options to meet the clean power plan, that that. RPS program should be additive rather than complementary. And, and I'll also just say that, you know, um, we've said that states should, you know, restore this regulatory surplus for the voluntary market because otherwise there's this transfer of wealth from voluntary renewable energy buyers to EGU owners. Um, you know, the voluntary purchasers of renewable energy uh, are paying for EGU compliance and making compliance cheaper for coal and natural gas. Well, the same is true for ratepayers, you know, in the case that an RPS is used to help meet clean power plan targets. It, you know, if states use their RPSs as complementary measures, which is automatic in mass-based states unless allowances are retired for the RPS, and where IRCs are issued and used for compliance uh, for the RPS megawatt hours in rate-based states, then the RPS, you know, is subsidizing clean power plan compliance for emitting generators. And that means that load-serving entities and rate payers are paying for the RPS, uh, that, are, that are paying for the RPS are subsidizing compliance for coal and natural gas. And, uh, you know, depending on how rate payers feel about that, um, you know, th that could be something that the state wants, wants to address. You know, why should rate payers that have agreed to pay more for renewable energy through the RPS, pay for clean power plant compliance for coal and natural gas. You know, whether it's, uh, in either case, if the RPS is complementary or if the voluntary market is counted towards compliance, there is a transfer of wealth from the rate payer to affected EGUs, and that may be something that the state wants to do something about. Todd, we've come to the end of our time. Um, uh, I think Ed, Ed wanted to make clear that he, he wasn't advocating that, but I appreciate that clarification. I'd also like to make one other clarification. Um, uh, Todd mentioned that CRS is submitting comments to EPA on the federal implementation plan and the model rule. Um, RAP has not read those comments. We are not joining in on those comments and have nothing to do with them. Um, I just want that to be entirely clear. With that, I want to thank uh, you all for sticking with us. There are over 150 of you who have gone 90 minutes on this stuff. You are tough people. I appreciate your willingness to learn more about this. Please take advantage of those emails. Follow up with us. We didn't get, we got to about two-thirds of the questions we received from you, so please feel free to follow up with the speakers. I'd like to thank Ed Holt and Todd Jones for uh, doing such a great job on this webinar, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.